After the shocking finale of the last issue, the DC Universe stands divided, half with the Titans team and half with Amanda Waller, whose vicious methods may very well have saved them, but only for now. What'll happen next? Well, let's hop into the pages of Titans Beast World issue number five, the penultimate issue of this crossover event, and find out what happens next together, shall we? So then, picking up directly from where the last issue left off, the superhero community is still shocked and gobsmacked by the death of Beast Boy in his Star of the Conqueror form. No one is more despondent, though, than Gar's love, Raven, who was actually inside his mind at the moment of death. Obviously, she's feeling a lot of emotions right now. But more than anything, she desperately wants someone to pay for what's been done here, and she decides to zero in on Dr. Hate, the mysterious chaos magic user who kicked all of this off. Dr. Hate, of course, you'll remember, was working for Amanda Waller as part of a much bigger conspiracy, one that is finally starting to bear fruit. The President of the United States States publicly congratulates Amanda Waller, who for the first time ever is actually able to leave the clandestine world as a spy master and actually step out into the public eye. As the new leader of the Bureau of Sovereignty, the Wall takes this opportunity to do a victory lap, as well as further stick it to the heroes by doctoring the events of Chester Runk's death, saying that he died as a hero serving his country unlike those damn titans. Even though we as the reader know damn well that Runk was forced at gunpoint in into servitude by Waller after Peacemaker killed his family. The absolute worst part is, is Waller isn't even done yet either. With Garfield the Conqueror dead, no more spores can be created, but they still have to deal with all the beast people still left on Earth. And what exactly is Waller's plan for the almost million plus beast people still running around? Well, kill them all and let God sort them out. After all, she now has unchecked authority in the American government, and that includes dispatching the full military might of America's drone army. This means that Nightwing and the rest of the Titans team have precious little time left to try and formulate a plan to change back all of the people who have been transformed. Cyborg surprises absolutely everyone by saying that if worse came to worse, he should be able to hack the drone army remotely, but they don't want to have to cross that bridge until they get to it. It's here too when things seem at their absolute worst. Tom Taylor is smart enough to actually slow the story down and once again refocus on the human heart of things, which is is, of course, Raven and her love for the now-departed Beast Boy. Raven talks about how angry she is and that if she really wanted, she could release her demon side from the diamond on her forehead and have absolute revenge on Amanda Waller. Hell, she could stop her heart from afar and no one would know. But Rachel would know, and as she said before, she was inside Garfield's mind when he died. He knew the risk he was taking by becoming a Starro. And he didn't fear death, he only feared hurting the people he loved with his absence, as Raven said, says he was a beautiful, infuriating man whose ideals she will now have to live up to. And honestly, I think that's a pretty damn beautiful summation of Beast Boy as a character. Taylor really nails it. With very few options left and time running out, Nightwing decides to take a contingent of his team to the Special Bureau of Sovereignty headquarters, where he hopes he can force Waller to see reason. Again, Dick isn't stupid, and he knows very well that this might end up being a one-way trip for him, and that the rest of the team should be ready for some such an eventuality. He also thinks that maybe Raven should stay outside for her own good. It's not that he doesn't trust Raven to go nuts and kill Amanda Waller, but hey, still. It's here too, we also learn the unnamed American president actually didn't sign off on Waller's big plan to exterminate millions of American lives through the use of a drone army. And I mean, oh wow, an American president didn't want to use drones? Surely this is a comic book fantasy we're in. But it's made abundantly clear that the president is terrified of the monster he's created in Waller. Waller says that all the president needs to do is sit back and reap the glory while she does all the hard stuff. Nightwing manages to crash this scene and we get a very fun little battle between him and Peacemaker. Peacemaker, of course, a character who's been walking a really interesting line ever since the John Cena show got so popular. By which, of course, I mean he needs to remain competent enough to be a major player in all of these big events happening in this story, but also he needs to be hilarious enough that Dick can just defeat him by turning his helmet backwards. With Peacemaker dealt with, Dick finally has a chance to have a one-on-one -on -one with the wall. He says that it's pretty obvious what she's trying to do now, turn the American people against the Titans as a team and superheroes as a whole. But that surely not even Waller is cold-hearted enough to kill a million-plus people just because she can't control the superheroes the same way she can control her squad. Only, yeah, you guessed it, Waller absolutely is that cold-hearted, basically saying that the age of the superhero is coming to an end. People don't want 
vigilante justice. They want swift, definitive punishment against their enemies. They want gods and despots, and Waller and her conspirators are all too happy but to deliver that. Thankfully, Cyborg is able to hack the drone army before they can start killing people. Not that Waller sees this as a setback at all. In fact, she's overjoyed saying, wow, you know what? If it was always going to be so easy to trick the Titans into starting a war with the American government, she would have killed Beast Boy a long time ago. Again, ice-cold villain shit that Raven is none too happy to hear pushing Waller up against the wall. It's only here, though, when Raven really starts trying to let the Beast out does she realize that crystal she wears on her head? Yeah, it's actually empty. But if her darker demon self isn't in there, where is it? Well, here's the thing, the evil side of Raven has actually been right in front front of us all along. We knew that Dr. Hate was a character recognizable enough that they had to keep his face secret this whole time. Well, there's a reason for that. You see, Doc Hate actually is the darker, more demonic side of Raven. And you know what? As the comic comes to a close, I'll freely admit, I did not see that coming. And so that was Titans Beast World issue number five, everybody. And I gotta say, this penultimate issue really does manage to wrap it up the tension like never before in a story that has admittedly been pretty damn tense since it all started. The Titans as a team are doing everything in their power to fight the good fight and minimize casualties as much as humanly possible. Unfortunately, the enemy they're fighting is Amanda Waller at her most devious. She's already thought three moves ahead. She's already figured out the best way to strike at them without any repercussions. She's hiding behind a veneer of law and order, meaning the only way the heroes can actually stop her is if they openly break the law themselves. But perhaps the best part about this story still is how Tom Taylor continues to focus on character, the relationship between Beast Boy and Raven and how it's being tested by all of this. Hell, I wasn't really convinced by Dr. Hate as a villain, but now that I know it's actually a more evil version of Raven under the mask, I kind of like it a lot more. Hell, I've been saying forever Raven would probably make a good Dr. Fate. So to see the cracked mirror version of all of that here in this story is kind of cool, and honestly, with the big finale just one issue away, I don't really know what to expect going into it. Overall, I would give it a strong 8.5. 5 out of 10. Hey there everyone, it's your pal Kate Joel again, and if you're seeing my face right now, that means you watched at the end of the video, and I'll always be grateful for that. Retention helps in this crazy YouTube game, and so does becoming a patron. If you head on down to the description, you can find a link to my Patreon page. Recently just redid all the tiers, a lot of cool stuff offering up there, exclusive commentaries, exclusive polls, uh, behind the scenes concept art for Capes and Quest, that's the brand new D&D show I've started soon. Never been a better time to become a patron. You can become a patron for as little as a dollar a month and help the channel grow and you know help me continue to deliver content like what you just saw so i want to thank you all and i will see you again next time bye bye